question was regarding your uh, legal design pattern approach. And I don't even remember the slide when where you were presenting all those recurring patterns of uh, impact assessment. But just listening to, to Lucas' comment, I, I was thinking whether we're talking about impact assessment that is done by a first party or a third party, we're not essentially talking about the same processes, right? I mean, there are big differences which sort of, I mean, when you're trying to do an essentialist approach to a process like impact assessment, makes the things a little bit more complicated, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to address whether you were addressing that, which is, I think, a defining question. Uh, I think so. It's There is some flexibility to describe different options of how to govern. So what I also uh, notice just looking at my material, so the interface between assessor and potentially a governmental agency, it takes many different forms. So is it that the agency is actively involved or do they report to them or does it get involved after a certain threshold? So at this point I try to kind of see the palette of things, but I think one can kind of group as a potential element of impact assessment, like interaction with a with a kind of regulator or external assessor. So So you would still consider that essentially this is a self regulatory process? I think like I'm more leaning towards of uh, of having let's say description of self regulatory and regulator involved processes as a kind of either like a, a loop with with um, alternative elements or two two separate processes. But generally, the design pattern approach it it does try towards essentialism, but there's also kind of discussion of pattern languages. So, kind of what different elements of networks of elements come together to for an impact assessment as a as a design pattern. Okay. Uh, maybe Alina, maybe you move here so everyone can see you, and yeah. you have the mic. Yes, please. Hello, I'm Christy. I'm also a visiting researcher coming from Munich. And I wonder, isn't um, impact assessment the best thing we have in the presence of uncertainty? Because like the problem, I think impact assessment is part of the larger trend of proceduralization because we have very different AI systems, we have a lot of insecurity, so it's difficult for the regulator to establish standards which the systems need to respect to say they have to like perform this way and this way. So the only thing the legislator in the end can do to is to establish a procedure the maybe a, a developer or the user has to follow when he develops or uses the AI system. Of course this um, a impact assessment still has problems and difficulties but isn't it the, yeah, the best thing we have? Uh, I completely agree that it does relate to the wider trend of proceduralization and also when we're dealing with a kind of something happening in the future, we kind of predict so much that it's kind of a part of legitimization of our actions to also show that we did everything which is reasonably within our means to predict. Uh, at the same time, uh, my worry is that, that uh, if we're not mindful, it can be just a paper tiger we're, we're not really designing the governance surrounding the use of this instrument mindfully and then we have also our alternative approaches uh, so we might go more towards precautionary principle in, in terms of like what that just seems to be too much unknowns we just uh, put a moratorium or ban this altogether or we can have like more fluid approaches such as regulatory sandboxes where might we might think that actually we don't even know the norms that we need to apply, but how about we observe this? It's also similar to kind of assessing impact, but it's kind of, uh, you have a bit of exposed approach and more open kind of palette of values that could take uh, place. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just building on this Q&A. Maybe just uh, uh, introduce yourself. So. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Hofit Vassalman-Mosin. I'm a PhD candidate here in the Dutch uh, supervision of NEVA and uh, I uh, focus mainly on explainability. But uh, as for your uh, talk, I wanted to complement your approach because I find that um, the ability to highlight 
what is uh, problematic with a certain uh, uh, pattern or approach is great to figure out as regulators and as a society, even if we use this tool, we don't have to you know, toss it aside. But what is the most important challenge that we see, one, two, three, that we should address if we are to implement uh, AI impact assessment as a tool? So this approach is so helpful for regulators, I think, to just go over the list and say, okay, there are a lot of challenges here. We think that the most important challenges to tackle are this one and this one. How can we mitigate those problems in order to, do, to facilitate the use of AI impact assessment in, in, uh, I don't know, in, a, um, in a level that we feel comfortable with, even if not uh, you know, uh, perfect? So I find this approach very helpful uh, in the end. Would you like me to list what's the question one, two, three uh, top points? Or? That's, a, that's a good answer, so go ahead. Uh, I think one is operate, like giving a practice of how to operationalize the, the, the lack of values to the developers. Because, for example, in European Union, if you mention fundamental rights, it's like 53 of them. And then I <laughs> And then I, I saw a really nice report in Finland on how to operationalize non-discrimination in, uh, in public administration. It had 73 checkpoints for different, different people, so just you can go endlessly assessing. So kind of giving some essentially standard of what are the values, what you should do. Then uh, you need some oversight or remedies. And then I think third is just like constant awareness of just limits of our cognitive function, both as an expert, both in terms of predicting what's to come, and just like be a bit humble in, in that sense. So I, I have a question now. Uh, also, just thinking about, uh, we, we often think of uh, impact assessment as uh, creating a, a threshold for liability issues, right? We want to know well, we, we cannot predict the future, we don't know what's going to happen, but we want to make sure that at least an organization has you know, taken into consideration what was reasonable, right? So even if you cannot predict. Uh, and so my question to you is to what extent there are any studies about the uh, usefulness, you know, of this type of threshold in terms of, you know, of being used in litigation and you know, for, for showing negligence, for instance, or you know, something of that sort, especially in the context of the GDPR, when it was actually, you know, I wonder whether there is any experience, you know, with using these type of, uh, of uh, tools in this context. And the other issue uh, that is more difficult to measure, I think, in impact assessment is the actual duty. Even if it is not helpful, even if we cannot predict, just the, I think that one of the assumptions of impact assessment is that if you have to take it into consideration, that would affect your behavior. That has to do with the Fritz uh, also thesis about explainability, and that is, it is actually, the assumption is that impact assessment can actually, even if it is not predicting everything, it is regulating your behavior to be, you know, more cautious about, you know, some uh, issues. So I wonder how that fits your thesis and whether you know of any empirical studies, you know, that to, to confirm that. Uh, really good questions uh, regarding empirical studies of using as evidence. I so I haven't scouted literature from this perspective, but what might be a hindrance is that in uh, data protection impact assessments are not public, so it's difficult to oversee. And this is one of the kind of design measures that kind of come come over and over as a as a claim that you should make impact assessment really, like reasonably public. Uh, for them to be effective and also invite oversight from also other people than a regulator potentially. Uh, that's uh, the first uh, first point, and then uh, the second point. Um, can you please remind me? <laughs> um, sure. Um, 
As to the fact, just uh, just to follow up on the public issue, uh, this could also this could be revealed in, the, in disclosure, right? I mean, so that's through litigation. So if there was a harm, and you say uh, yeah, the company should have known that this system will discriminate against black people in I don't know in credit scoring, right? And then, you know, through litigation, you can require the disclosure of the impact assessment that they did, even if it was not published. So I think this is something that stakeholders will actually take into account. And so the question was also about, not just about liability threshold, but also um, about the way in which impact assessment is, is affecting the decision-making process of an organization, if there is any, I guess, in, I don't know, organizational study, I don't know if like in, in which discipline that would actually be. Um, I come more across the discussion how it should impact organizational uh, processes and how it's not only the technical dimension but also like how people behave surrounding the technology and of course you need to also break it down towards the, well, is it a question about data, is it about testing, is it uh, other downstream uses. But, uh, but it's also interestingly present in the GDPR. So I think impact assessment is just a reflection of data protection by design principle. And that's really, uh, I mean, it requires both technical organizational measures. And it's tricky because they don't travel so well. You need to be, I mean, it's kind of something more ambiguous to organize. But yeah, definitely having more systematic assessments of how this work from, from research perspective would be interesting. Uh, so very rich exploration. I, I, I'm looking at this issue as well, and I would frame some of the issues that you've described as sort of the governance issues of technologies, and following the uh, Raphael Geller, who's written about the risk-based approach to data protection. So he's uncovered some of the dilemmas here. We are talking about an impact assessment, so making it sound like it's very technological and professional, but there are actually two disciplines here, right? One is substantive, about human rights, fundamental rights, and here, the procedure may lead to something like uh, uh, bringing more stakeholders into the discussion and legislators and policy makers sort of passing the buck to the regulators, which themselves are passing the buck to the companies, which themselves are trying to estimate, and this is their risk, what type of compliance they will be there to. So actually, our fundamental rights are translated at the end of this chain to the risk that some regulator or court will, okay? so. And then there's another more technical type of thing, which is how do I uh, enforce these whatever substantive outcomes on the organization in which I'm deploying this, this technology. And I think this helped maybe organize the type of uh, communication mechanisms and the role of regulation here in, in giving, making things more orderly. And I think that the development between data protection and artificial intelligence, maybe this is an optimistic view, is that the way artificial intelligence is uh, regulated now is more comprehensive towards its whole life cycle, whereas data protection always looks when data is used. So perhaps um, things will be easier with the AI impact assessment because they take a comprehensive view of the life cycle and not only like data protection impact assessments focus on the controller. But thank you. Thank you. Can I, uh, can I comment? So uh, the, the last point that I can, I can see what you describe in, in the legislative initiatives. So uh, in uh, GDPR, uh, you, the trigger point for second impact assessment is that if something essentially changes dramatically, then in the Digital Services Act it's repeated. And if I recall correctly in the AI proposal, there, there's kind of more leaning towards this repetition, which is supporting the life cycle approach as opposed to this ad, uh, ad hoc approaches. And on this normative side, there is a preprint of Orwood et al. I referenced them in the, in the um, uh, presentation where they look into the normative issues with risk-based approach. And it's a really interesting paper. So it might be interesting for the audience here. one for 
information including uh, uh, income assessment uh, matter or something. And as far as I'm concerned, um, the principle of the AI Act is a list-based approach. And I was wondering um, what's the difference between uh, income assessment and this list-based approach in AI? Uh, that's, uh, that's a good question. Because, um, so, before this, uh, this proposal with uh, the specific impact assessment, I was, I was going through uh, AI Act and it's, how would I say, like they, they have all this technical requirements what you need to consider, which kind of probably have as a consequence mitigation of certain fundamental rights risks, so, such as discrimination, or you have human in the loop, which kind of have a lot of imaginaries of what, what that can do. But uh, it was still a bit ambiguous of what, what's the uh, normative palette that they're using. And also since a conformity assessment was, was something which companies then would do according to certain standard and whether the fundamental rights are really a, a part of it, it's a bit unclear and murky and probably not very attractive to them to be very conscientious about. So uh, I do find it important that there's an explicit mention, but again, like when you mention fundamental rights, you mention 53 rights. That's, that's also a lot to, to handle. So how to find balance between implementability in business every day, and then kind of, let's say, what, the, what are the values that we really want uh, to be present and attached to AI? Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Randolph from the Faculty of Engineering. Um, I'd like to um, um, ask more from a, a user computer interaction, user interaction point of view, and maybe ask you and then to, to comment um, about the involvement of users in the impact assessment process. So, for example, there are a couple of studies, one of them done by, by, by my former PhD student, that looked at uh, impact assessment and privacy, and for example, showing that uh, kind of users have different ways of looking at impact assessment, different problems than what engineers look at, and the way things are presented to them also make a huge difference. And I think you've touched about it, uh, I don't know, when you talked about like, problems in specific impact assessment, but especially with AI and going forward. Um, um, I'd, I'd like to think, like, hear about maybe both your thoughts about how, where users can be involved, what do we know doesn't work, maybe we know some things that do work. It's kind of broad, you know. Uh, if, I, if I comment that, so um, I came to this topic from smart cities angle, and I think my kind of literature review was counting first like more smart city literature where there's a huge conversation of how stakeholders are not sufficiently consulted and then uh, looking into human rights impact assessment and there the common problem is that kind of the most mar marginalized people don't have the resources or capacity to to take part and then the kind of the threshold of explaining whatever innovative aspect you're you're selling is is kind of higher than if you're consulting with some uh, middle class uh, tech excited person, just as, a, as an example. But I think uh, Uri was also mentioning really, like I didn't really cover this aspect, but this kind of interface of, of users <coughs> interacting with the technology and then spotting, spotting issues with it. So maybe if you want to uh, continue. Yeah, so uh, I will, it will be interesting to see what uh, your PhD student work, uh, worked on, but um, um, yeah, I mean, users are currently, it's, it's very difficult for users to take, to take part in the system the way it's currently structured, both because users don't have a systematic overview of the system, they only see their own small uh, viewpoint, which is often personalized and targeted. Uh, um, and secondly, they don't have the expertise to, to conduct any meaningful, uh, and they don't have the financial incentive. This is the issue with the bounty. So even if I'm, I, I am an engineer and I spot some potential bias, 
whether I'll meet with my friends and start to make a project out of it is uh, debatable. But uh, I think if we'll find institutional ways to empower users, for example, the data trust literature saying, okay, maybe we have an entity that will have a, an overview look and sh will do this analysis and share it with users, and then users can put an informed input uh, about how this is. But I, I mean, the changes needs to be done for, for it to be feasible because currently users are not able to make meaningful impact. One, just, uh, one, one sentence. If it's a third party ancestor, it also puts enormous pressure on them to towards both communicating on the technological aspect with the developers and humorous aspect with them, but also go to the stakeholders and communicate the same thing to them that they understand the context and and then the values. So I'm not even sure what field of expert you need to be to, to kind of handle all of that. Questions about impact assessment have been discussed uh, a decade ago when we introduced uh, the environmental impact assessment, both in the EU and uh, in the ICJ uh, cases, just, such as the Uruguay and Argentina case. And uh, the problems are not are not unique to AI. Uh, the ambiguity, the subjectiveness, all of these problems with uh, impact assessments are common and relevant to other fields. So we have more safeguards that are put in place on environmental damage. So I would suggest looking also into the environmental regulation, which is it, it's very much the same. We, have, we, have, we worry about common rights, common goods. There is a large mass of interests and the rights that are in, in, that impacted or affected in an adverse way. And uh, we have to create a free way for entrepreneurship but still keep those safeguards to protect those interests and rights from technological advancements. That's my question. Thanks a lot for, for that comment. I, I was maybe like skirting a little bit for environmental impact assessment because I thought coming from, from human rights angle, I thought like maybe social impact assessment is a bit closer, but it's a really good point to really go to the origin source to see what patterns emerge from there. So thank you. Hello, and we want to have some uh, students from campus as well. And my question is also more AI specific, uh, IA specific, and AI specific. <laughs> uh, and you, you mentioned that you find that impact assessment is dealing or assessing negative impacts or negative effects. And I'm wondering, maybe in the broader sense of addressing the assessing the impact of Product, maybe positive impacts should be implemented as well. And if there is a move, my question is if there's a move in regulatory oversight or in general assessments, if someone is also examining the positive effects of having the rights or in, in general, and when addressing and trying to balance these two issues. I think it's a, it's a really good point, and I think it also often gets neglected when we're kind of trying to see what's the bare minimum that's like needed anywhere to be safe. But uh, there are some discussion, I mean, there's a kind of AI for good, or how do you use artificial intelligence for, for example, providing accessibility. And I, I think, especially lawyers gears towards risk thinking, that's, that should be something we should keep in mind. Um, Another question, just as a follow-up on the environment, is um, how do you um, make uh, regulars? This is a question to the to both of you. How do you make? How do you empower regulators in this uh, context? Uh, because uh, sort of uh, the, one of the problems is that we have this extreme gaps of expertise, actually, and I think that is something that becomes. It, it's not just. Uh, it's a qualitative difference, you know, from environment. In the environment, you you can ha you can acquire the knowledge, and then you know the risks. Now, 
Um, you know, there are some controversies, there are some developments, but you can acquire, and here that seems to be um, a moving target, and there is always going to be a gap between those who are developing the technology and those who have to sort of get the paper with the risk assessment and do something with it, right? So, and, and if companies know that regulators cannot make use of it, so what is the purpose of all of that, right? How do you deal with this expertise gap? So, Selbst uh, has uh, written more on this, and really kind of he was focusing on this tension of needing to have input from companies while kind of they probably don't have incentives and there will still be like ambiguousness in, in that interaction. And what I thought was quite positive in his day that he was suggesting that even if individual impact assessment might not be perfect, then the fact that regulator has this accumulated knowledge and this ongoing relations with companies, in the end they there's an opportunity to learn and kind of see the bigger picture, even if it's a bit blurred with respect to individual applications. So I thought that was. Yeah. So, so this is a, this is a sort of a system that would update the regulator on an ongoing basis, like the expert control of cybersecurity sort of <laughs> oversight, right? Um, yeah, so I, I agree. I think I think this is one angle in which uh, impact assessment are, are a good tool because it's by definition it educates the regulator and provide us with information, and it's much easier to poke at something that is written down than trying to do the analysis yourself. Um, so I think impact assessments are, are pretty good at empowering the regulator. I agree that we should find ways to empower the regulator, maybe create new regulators, or allow find systems in which regulators should collaborate with the academia or with other institutions that will be more expert and will have some legal responsibility, uh, whether it's trust, fiduciary duty, or whatever other tool to make sure that we keep these systems overview uh, 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 focused on their public interests. But yeah, the regulator will probably have to delegate this responsibility to, uh, to some sort of uh, more expert overseers. That's what I think. There are some uh, experts in the room in, in uh, privacy, and I was wondering if you have any lessons from impact assessment in data protection. <laughs> Michael. Uh, what you said, sir. Yeah, Michael Burnett from See that the idea of privacy impact assessment has an internal power. Uh, the, the idea, I think, like other mechanisms, is to make the organizations think about what they're doing, rather than be, uh, you know, rather than transparency issues. It's nice to have, of course, but that's not the goal. It's not transparency. It's not liability, responsibility, it's accountability. It's more a way to internalize someone, oh, we have to do this impact assessment, so, okay, oh, what's this? Oh, so maybe we should do it this way, that way, etc. Of course, you know, if they're malicious, we just want to care about the dollars, like, you know, we uh, so, you know, so they will get away with it and just, you know, wish-wash it kind of in some way. Um, whether AI is at the stage that the internal mechanism can work or not, I don't know. Privacy is a little bit more established in this regard. And the overlap between AI and privacy is still to be explored. It's still to be explored in your paper. Maybe I'll add one other layer on that. I'm Ken Bamberger, I teach at UC Berkeley. Um, uh, one characteristic of privacy impact assessments is that there are a whole bunch of tools by which you can really interrogate through data flow mapping and other kind of concrete things where information is moving. Um, in one sense there, it's kind of one of the criticisms of privacy impact assessments are that they're kind of small in that way, but it also means uh, that they really are focused on actual things that you can measure, you can assess, and you can use to raise red flags. 
Um, and it seems to me that maybe you can say a word about um, in, in a world where so much is opaque um, and unpredictable even to the, uh, to the designers without, I mean, you mentioned iterative processes, which obviously are good, but how do you even get any traction on uh, looking forward to these risks if there's nothing new to measure? That's a, that's a very holistic question because, I mean, it kind of deals both with definition of, of what is the value at stake, what is the threshold, how it applies to that context, and whether you, it's seeable or observable. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I, I, can, I can answer to that. What kind of comes to my mind that kind of this conversation suggests that uh, impact assessment can be a tool for learning process, not only for regulator, but also for the organization, but also for the individual. If we go to the ignorance, kind of in terms of recognizing where we just can't see further, whether it's a technical issue or just a nature of not being a, being able to predict the future and I don't know how to move from there but I think we should be sober about it. I think one of the, the questions is that if you know it seems that regulators are now sort of putting in this uh, bucket a lot of tools together right so they say okay AI is this Boy, we don't know what it's going gonna, it's gonna to do. Let's just put impact assessment, risk assessment, audit, oversight, regulatory, temporary, periodical reports or whatever. And um, I guess uh, one of the questions is whether, you know, one can say, okay, there are all these risks, maybe we should put all of that, in, that would be a regulatory sandbox, right? Let's see what works mm -hmm. and then uh, but there seem to be a cost that comes with it, and I think one of the questions is whether impact assessment, you know, comes with a cost except for the cost of simply preoccupying companies with the cost of just going through processes that might be uh, useless. So actually, it's, it's interesting because, like you said, it, the, the mere process to, to build on what you and, and Michael said, that um, the mere process of having to do this impact assessment and the ability that will be used against me in some future litigation forces the companies to make this cost-benefit analysis themselves and maybe not take uh, 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 think twice about the unknowns, unknowns, and which risks they want to take and which risks are not. So. It, I think that the value of it, if impact assessment may be not to the regulator but to the company and the mere procedure hopefully can do good or bad. It's hard to test it in a, in a sandbox situation because uh, I don't know how to test that but at least the hypothesis is that by having to do this work maybe companies will be more cautious in how they, or otherwise we can just uh, stop the technology for, uh, for a while. For six months. Six months. <laughs> <laughs> I need seven months for my mother. <laughs> you want to add to that? Um, uh, no, I, I, to this question, I, I agree with this. Any more thoughts, comments? Yeah, Leo? This will be a really general question, unfortunately, because I don't know much about the topic that this assessment uh, relates to artificial intelligence. Uh, my question was about that relation you made with Nida's work, for instance, on private ordering in Kapra. Um Because I've been you know, using that, 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 that strain of scholarship as part of my own research. And I think one of the insights, one of the critical insights, was that, well, this is not only procedural. Through private ordering, some, some copyright owners, they substantially providing copyright. The generating norms that are just not what public copyright law said, right? Uh, so I know we're not talking about the same tools. In the case of private ordering and copyright, we're talking about contract and property, which gives you a lot of wiggle room to actually generate norms. And that's why everyone was so happy, for instance, with Creative Commons, and people were not so happy with digital right management systems, <laughs> even though they're sort of the same tools. 
my question is, is that a risk that we, when we're talking about impact assessment and when we let companies um, do it themselves, is there a risk that they will quietly sort of rewriting the norms against which, against which they're supposed to assess their behavior? Or is that out of the hands completely and the regulator is taking care of that and just ends down, end, ends down the, the rules and this is just procedural? Or do you think there is something more substantial that could happen over time? This is, this is actually a great question um, because indeed if, if it's more of a self-regulation matter, then it can become an industry standard or kind of accepted practice and then it's very difficult both for people or in liability context or for regulator to start arguing that okay you need to switch it around when there's also a common acceptance towards it but i think like there is like there is richness in that argument and uh, yeah thank you for making that point i guess that is also related to uri's point about or the examples of microsoft like companies are actually bridging this gap i mean who knows what the you need to have your uh, uh, systems fair who knows what that is here at Microsoft offering, or whatever, offering as an impact assessment tool, and then, you know, in later on when your system is dysfunctioning or creates some harm, you say, well, I took reasonable steps, right? I went through this impact assessment, and my, you know, system was scoring, you know, high, and and that was okay, and that becomes. In fact, the definition of what fairness is, at least for the foreseeable future, before we'll see some litigation or, you know, uh, you know, uh, decisions by regulators. So, privatization of norm setting is is definitely a risk. Yeah. Hi, my name is Eva. Um, I'm actually from Israel, so I work for insurance. Could you just speak up? I don't think that they can hear you. I don't think that's my loudest, actually. <laughs> so uh, I would like to go back, sure. So I would just, in, just for the sake of a uh, conversation, I would like to, to make some comments. I'm not sure. I don't have all the answers. I do have some comments. Um, first of all, I, I do agree with what you said earlier about the uh, regulators are studying from the from the paper that they are receiving from the from the companies, because uh, actually in almost in every area of regulation, the companies are more advanced and have more knowledge, even uh, in field of uh, investments and the fields that are regulated for a long, long time, for decades. The, the, the companies are are the business. They are the they are searching for the next thing, for the next things to, to profit from. So they will always be in front of us. Uh, so we the, and our strength come from seeing all the field, all the picture. We, our strengths come from uh, comparing uh, all the reports we, we get. And we can, we can uh, determine what is better. Once we, once we see all the, all the examples, we can say this is a better practice than this one, or this we maybe we can uh, combine it, and then we can uh, we can uh, advise uh, all the companies what to do, or we can say. What to do. Um, so this is this is the way a regulator uh, acts. We are, we are always behind the knowledge. So um, and, uh, and, in, uh, and in terms of a uh, of, uh, connection to the academia. Uh, uh, well, I'm here, so we are we are learning from what academia is doing, uh, but I'm not sure uh, giving academia uh, powers uh, would be a good thing uh, because it might um, uh, create uh, borders for what academia. What academia <coughs> uh, once you have a responsibility, once you have a, a certain a certain goal. You need to uh, <coughs> direct all your action to this goal. 
and the academia is rich, the research is just about thinking what can be interesting next, what is still unknown, and we need to go there. Regulation is not about that. So it might, it might hinder uh, academic work if it gets uh, responsibilities. But I do think there needs to be a connection, uh, maybe through empowering the users, or maybe through uh, the of that. I do agree also with what you said about uh, about uh, relation to other uh, fields of regulation uh, uh, in terms of uh, maybe ESG as the environmental assessment and maybe a privacy assessment because the the problems you specified are uh, relevant to all the fields so uh, so there are common. Oh, I just wanted to say, you, you pointed out the problem of privatization of norms. Mm -hmm. It's even bigger than that, where the next step of the problem, obviously, is kind of making these normative processes just symbolic. Uh, and in a sense, creating like what you say, part of them. And, uh, so you end up with, instead of a right to basic human rights, you end up with a right to this process which may or may not be empty or ceremonial. Great. Um, on this happy note, we actually have to, uh, <laughs> to stop here. And then there's an opportunity to thank you for a great uh, semester and a great year. And uh, uh, again, our last and final session will be during Cyber Week on uh, Cyber Surveillance on uh, Tuesday, June 27th at 3 o'clock, and I think it will be this actual. Thank you. Thank you so much.